Welcome to Teaching Women to Teach. My name is Lee Swanson, and I'm the Executive Vice President here at RTS Orlando. We started Teaching Women to Teach to serve the local church by providing accessible theological education to women who teach or aspire to teach the Bible in women's ministries, in neighborhood Bible studies, or just to a friend over a cup of coffee. Since 2018, we've served hundreds of women from around the world with Teaching Women to Teach courses. This six lecture series is our foundational course. It's called From Exegesis to Exposition. And you'll hear from RTS Orlando residential faculty who are experts in their fields. The first four lessons will teach important foundational truths about how to properly exegete a passage of scripture. Lesson five will provide you tools to faithfully apply the word of God to people's lives. And then in lesson six, one of our professors will teach you how to faithfully put what you've learned into a lesson. Now, in this first lecture, you'll hear from Dr. Scott Swain. He's the president and a professor of systematic theology at RTS Orlando. And he'll be teaching on the doctrine of scripture and how to observe a text. Our Father in heaven, the psalmist says that the unfolding of your word gives light. We pray that by your spirit, you would so unfold your word to us that we may behold the light of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Grant us to know how to exercise the sight that you've given us in devoting our attention to the Bible as it deserves. And we ask it that Christ might be glorified, that your church might be built up, that the nations might be gathered in. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with a question tonight. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone where they talk over you? You can't finish a sentence before they jump in, right? Uh, in fact, sometimes it seems like you're not even having a conversation. You are a victim of their verbal agenda. Well, the common experience that we have in conversation is one that we can have in interpreting the Bible as well. Uh, the Bible is God's word to us, and oftentimes we can find ourselves talking over God's word in Scripture. Uh, there are some kind of malign reasons for doing that. Uh, we don't want to hear what Scripture has to say. But there can be some less malign reasons as well. Sometimes we're so excited about what we're reading. We're, we're so eager to, to jump to the conclusion of understanding what a text means that we're not patient. That we're not really listening to what Scripture says. You remember in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Moses said to Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. And Jesus in the Gospels identifies this as the first and greatest commandment. Well, what I want to suggest to you tonight is that command, hear, listen, is also the first and greatest commandment when it comes to biblical interpretation. Tonight, we really want to do two things. We want to talk, first of all, about why the Bible is worthy of our attention. And as we'll see uh, from Psalm 19, it's worthy of our attention for a number of different reasons, but supremely because it is God's fullest and clearest word to us. But we also want to talk about how to give Scripture the attention it's due, or at least we want to start talking about that tonight in future lessons we'll have a chance to kind of build on some of the introductory foundations we're going to lay tonight. Now, the, the image I want to give you, I want you to keep in mind as we think through why the Bible is worthy of our attention and how we should be giving the Bible the attention that is due, is an image that comes out of Psalm 19 itself. In verse 10, where... 
the psalmist has described the law of the Lord in a number of different ways. And he says in the second half of verse 10 that it's sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. A medieval Bible interpreter named Hugh of St. Victor took this image as one of the primary ways of thinking about the attention that we owe Scripture. Scripture is sweeter than honey. That's the, the, the value, the, the worth, the goodness of what it teaches. But God doesn't give us the honey that He gives us in Scripture on a spoon. He gives it to us in a honeycomb. And for Hugh, this is very important to understanding how we come to acquire, how we come to receive the delectable gift that is the Word of God in Scripture. The thing about a honeycomb is that it's coarse on the outside, right? It, it's not sweet to the initial taste. It's only if you savor it, it's only if you let it melt in your mouth that you're actually going to get the good stuff. Well, what Hugh says is that that metaphor suggests something about Scripture. If we're really going to receive the, the sweetness that God offers to us in Scripture, we need to receive it in the way that He's given it to us, which is in a book that was written over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It's in a book that was written in various languages, in the context of various cultures. And while sometimes we might want to kind of rush to the conclusion, we, we wish we just squeeze the honey out of it. Hugh says that if we're going to receive that sweetness the way that Lord intends to give us, then we need to receive it in the way the Lord gives it to us. We need to, to savor it. We need to, to let that honeycomb, as it were, melt in our mouth to fully partake of its good fruits. Humble attention to God's Word involves receiving God's honey in the form He gives it, trusting that He's wise to give it in this way and not another. Now, there's one more significance, I think, to this, this metaphor, and I hope that really the entirety of this course will prove that it's true. Part of the significance of God giving His Word to us in the way that He's given to us, and, and, and part of the, the requirement that that form of the Word of God demands from us in terms of attention, in terms of savoring the Word, I think what it will also show to us is that it's not just sweetness that lies at the end of the study of the Word of God, when we, we feel like we, we've grasped, at least in part, what God wants to teach us in a text. But sweetness also lies in the discovery itself and in the process of discovery. And, and, and this is part of how God shows His wisdom to us and the way He has revealed His Word to us. All right, so uh, two things I want to talk about tonight. First of all, why the Bible is worthy of our attention. And to use Hugh's metaphor, which he gets from Psalm 19, it's because it's honey, right? It's sweeter than honey. It's better than gold. The second thing we want to look at is how we can give the Bible the attention it deserves. And I will thirdly just briefly talk about the, the goal of, of our attention, the ends of our attention as a way of looking forward to future lessons. But the two main things we want to talk about is why the Bible is worthy of our attention, because it's God's Word written to us, but then also how to give the Bible the attention that it deserves. So first, why? Why the Bible is worthy of our attention. Here's the, the, the big claim that Psalm 19 makes about the Bible and that we're going to spend some time unpacking. Beyond what God reveals about Himself in general revelation, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment, general revelation, what 
the Belgic Confession calls the, the book of nature. Beyond what God reveals about himself through general revelation, God reveals himself more fully and more clearly in the book of Scripture. And in doing so, he not only reveals himself, he not only reveals his will, he also teaches us how to speak back to him. And Psalm 19 is a great psalm for seeing that. So, Scripture, to, to, to get back to the honey metaphor, it's the, the sweetest, it's the, the supreme mode of communication in this life that God engages with us. And therefore, it's worthy of our receiving it with thanksgiving. It's worthy of our devoting our attention to it that we may draw out its delectable gifts. All right. I want to look at the psalm in, in two, three major sections. First, we'll look at verses 1 through 6, where the psalmist speaks about how God reveals himself through creation, what we call general revelation. It's called general revelation because it's available to a general audience, how God reveals himself to everyone through creation. Then we're going to look in verses 7 and follow how God reveals himself in Scripture and to what end God reveals himself in Scripture, what we sometimes call special revelation because it's how God speaks directly to his people. Uh, I'm going to read the whole psalm and then we'll dive in. Psalm 19, to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So verses 1 through 6, the psalmist begins and before he talks about how God reveals himself in Scripture, he wants to talk about how God reveals himself in nature, and specifically how God reveals himself through the heavens and through the really chief inhabitant of the heavens, the sun. He uses a number of different words to describe the heavens in their revelatory function. The heavens declare, the sky above proclaims, day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. Now, I think there's a, a, an assumption in, in, in the writer's mind that if we're not familiar with the kind of ancient Near Eastern cosmology and ancient Near Eastern understanding of kings and so forth, we're likely to miss. What the psalmist is imagining when he thinks of the heavens declaring the glory of God, when he thinks specifically about the sun in a moment which comes out of its chamber and travels through the course of the sky, 
he is picturing God as the divine king, and he's picturing the sun especially, but also the heavens as well, as God's royal ambassadors that, that go before him, that announce his coming, right? In the ancient world, when a king was arriving to a city, he sent a party ahead of him, a retinue, right? And that party was the sign that the king is coming. You see this very idea in Isaiah chapter 40, where you have uh, the, the language of a messenger who's going before the Lord to prepare his way. And then Isaiah 52, 7, you get the language of the good news, right? And it says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who declares good news. What is it about a messenger's feet that makes him lovely? Well, the idea is that you've got watchmen who might be sitting on the wall of a city, and the king has gone out to battle. And the watchmen are waiting to receive news from the battlefront of whether their side has won or lost. And the idea is that long before you could ever hear the watchman's voice, you could tell by his feet whether he had good news or bad news. Right? Someone who is running with joy looks different than someone who's running for their lives. And so the heavens, the sun specifically here, is being portrayed as God's royal ambassador going before him, declaring the glory of the Lord. And, and the reason I think this is indeed what's going on, you see a similar thing in Psalm 97 where it says, it's almost the exact same phrase, the heavens declare his glory. And Psalm 97 begins saying, the Lord is king. And then it talks about the Lord coming to judge his people. And the heavens, again, they declare his glory. They're announcing his coming. Paul, in Romans chapter 10, chapter we're all very familiar with, cites Isaiah 52, 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him pro pro proclaiming the good news, the Lord reigns. He cites Isaiah 52, 7 and our psalm, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And these are both used as different examples of royal ambassadors who proclaim our God reigns. Now, once we have that in place, it helps us to start appreciating what the psalm is claiming about the nature of general revelation, about how God reveals himself through creation, in this case, through the heavenly bodies and supremely the Son. You see in verse 2 that the psalmist says that these royal ambassadors, these heavenly ambassadors, their message is spoken at all times. So verse 2, day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. You see in verse 4 and verse 6 that as their proclamation goes to all times, so it goes to all space. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Look down at verse 6, talking about the sun. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. So it rises in the east, it sets in the west. As far as you can see one direction, that's where the sun rises. As far as you can see in the other direction, that's where the sun sets. And so the scope of general revelation is, is universal. It reaches all times all places, declaring the glory of the Lord. Now, skipped over verse 3, but look at verse 3, because this is very important for appreciating what the psalmist is going to say about Scripture in a moment. He says, There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. What's going on here? He just said, they declare, they proclaim, they pour out speech, they reveal knowledge. And now he's saying, there's no speech. There's not a voice that is heard. Well, what's going on when someone affirms one thing and then immediately denies it? Well, that's a clue that we're dealing with figurative language here, right? He's saying, I'm going to date myself. Y'all remember Teletubbies? 
So our oldest daughter took her first step walking toward the TV with Teletubbies. Um, I'm sorry, it's a very controversial show, but <laughs> you remember Teletubbies? One of the, the features of Teletubbies is you had this big sun in the sky, and it had this baby face that was kind of laughing and giggling, something like that, right? Well, we, we often personify creation, right? And it's actually pretty common to personify the sun and so forth. Um, well, the psalmist is saying here, I'm not saying the sun literally speaks. I'm not saying that the, the heavens literally declare the glory of the Lord. Then what is he saying? Well, they proclaim his glory in a different way. And, and if you think about it for two seconds, we understand exactly how this works. Have you ever driven by a house and said, I wonder who lives there? You ever passed a, a, a series of limousines on the highway and said, boy, I wonder who's coming through town today. Now, the house doesn't literally say anything, right? The, the, the series of limos don't literally say anything, but they speak volumes, don't they? Right? They signify something. And this is what the psalmist is saying about general revelation. It does not use words. And yet, it speaks very, very loudly. Who designed these things? Who made these things? Augustine, talking about the nature of general revelation at one point, he says, all of God's creation says, we did not make ourselves. Look to the one who made us. And this is what Psalm 19 is saying too. Now, General revelation. God reveals himself by means of these heavenly ambassadors. All times, all places. But it's not literal speech, but it's speech nonetheless. They signify something about the glory of the divine king. The one who made them, they are his works. They're his handiworks. They reflect his glory. Now, it's important, I think, before we move on to talk about special revelation, how God reveals himself through Scripture, to note what the psalmist believes that general revelation reveals about God. And just note a few things that, that are, I think, clear in this psalm. First, the regularity of general revelation. The fact that it occurs day after day, night after night. Right? How many of you, you know, when you went to bed last night, you were worrying about something? It's hard not to. Right? But how many of you were worried about whether the sun was going to rise today? Probably not. We take it for granted. Right? The courses of nature are, they, they operate regularly. Right? How many of you, uh, the last time you picked up a bottle of water and took a sip, you wondered, you know what? The hundreds of thousands of other times that I've taken a sip of water, it's quenched my thirst, it's been a source of health and nourishment and so forth, but I'm a little worried that this time, water might kill me. It's a silly question to ask, right? But we take for granted the regularity of the world that God has made. Well, in the psalmist's mind, the regularity of creation, the fact that the sun travels its course every day, that the moon travels its course in the stars every night. This is a sign that the divine king can be trusted. He's reliable. Right? Though the world is full of chaos, though the world is, is full of disorder, God has not left himself without a witness to his faithfulness and reliability. And the regularity of nature is a sign of that. Second, the universality of general revelation. The fact that it reaches all creatures and all creation. right? That that sun, it rises as far as you can see in the east and it sets as far as you can see in the west. Nothing is hidden from its heat, the psalmist says. That's a sign of the universality of God's reign. And again, you have to think uh, of the... You know, think of the limos driving down there. Think of the house, right? The, the greater the sign, 
the greater the king that is being represented. And so the fact that these heavenly ambassadors, they don't just travel through one nation, right? They don't just speak one language. But there is no nation, right? There is no people that are hidden from their influence. It says that Lord reigns over all. He's not just the God of this people or this place, which in the ancient world, that was the most common assumption about a God. Gods were local deities, right? Or gods were concerned with one facet of reality, fertility or farming or something like that. And what Psalm 19 says, nope, God rules all things. All things are from his hand and he rules over all. He's a great God and a great king above all gods, Psalm 95 says. Now, the last thing that the psalm, <clears throat> psalmist points out in talking about the nature of general revelation, and, and this already is anticipating a theme that we've already mentioned in talking about honey, talking about gold, and what we're going to see when the psalmist turns to special revelation, he really, really wants to bear down on and, and draw out. Last thing that general revelation teaches us according to Psalm 19 is about God's goodness. And specifically, the psalmist believes that the joy, and that's the metaphor he uses, the joy that we see in general revelation signifies the supreme goodness of the divine king. Look at uh, verses into verse 4 all the way to verse 6. And it's fascinating. You know, he set the theme, the heavens declare the glory of God. He's talked about the universality, the, 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 the daily regularity. And then he really spends an, an extra large amount of space in the psalm giving one specific example of how the heavens declare the glory of God. And the example he gives is the sun. And he makes two comparisons about the sun that emphasize just how happy the sun is at being the sun. It's a pretty remarkable thing. So, so look at end of verse 4. In them, that is in the skies and the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And you have to see the idea that in the ancient world that the sea would have been understood as the chamber of the sun. Right? He emerges from his chamber at sunrise. And, switches to another comparison, like a strong man runs its course with joy. So he's like a bridegroom waking up the morning after his wedding, I guess, and he's in a good mood. Okay? Or he's like a strong man who's running a race, and he runs it with joy because he's well-trained, he's well-prepared, it, it, it's, it's not a thing that's burdensome to him. He's ready to go. Now, why is it that the psalmist will describe the sun in this way? These, these two images as joyful, right? As unhindered in fulfilling his vocation of being a, ro a royal ambassador. And really, you've got to think back to Psalm, uh, Isaiah 52.7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him? This is another way of making the same point. Right? Why, why does he think of the sun this way? Well, because in the biblical worldview, and, and really, you see this in all cultures, light is regarded as a positive good. And darkness as something that's not good. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of different reasons for it. But one of them is we're made for the daytime. Psalm 104 says as much, right? The night is made for the creepy crawlies that, that wander around, for the young lions that search for their food. But man was made for the day. Light is essential for human existence. John describing the word in, in John chapter 1, in him was life and the life was the light of men, right? But beyond that, light just has positive connotations. So, you think of the uh, Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, which the priests were to pronounce on the people of God as a sign of God's favor towards them. Well, what's the metaphor used to describe God's favor? The Lord bless you and keep you. 
the Lord make his face shine upon you. And, and even beyond scripture, we, we talk about this. Do you want your teeth to be white and shiny? Or do you want them to be brown and dull? Right? When you meet someone who's happy, how do you describe them? Oh, she's got such a bright personality. Versus someone you say is dull, morose. And so the sun, light, is associated with all that is good. And so the psalmist says, if light is good, then this universal light, which, which causes all, every crop on the face of the earth to grow, which causes tree time to bloom, right? which gives us our suntans and warms our lakes so that we can water ski. Sorry. Right? If the sun is that kind of good, how much greater how much better must be the divine king whose coming he announces? So, general revelation is a wonder, and, and it's something that this psalmist celebrates, and he invites us to, to really open our eyes and look at the world and see it as a theater of God's glory, with the ambassadors that he put in their position right at the beginning of creation to daily remind us of the glory of our God and king. But that's just the beginning, because the psalmist describes the way God reveals himself in general revelation really as a setup, as a preparation for what he believes is an even greater and fuller revelation of God, which God gives in his word. Look again at verses uh, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. God reveals himself wonderfully in general revelation, but according to these verses, he reveals himself more fully through his word in Scripture. Now, I'm going to come back to this point when we turn to our second topic tonight and talk about how we can give Scripture the attention it is due. But I want you to note something right here. In verses 1 through 6, God is named only one time. And he's named by the title God, Elohim in Hebrew. In verses 7 through 11, God is named six times. Now, 7 through 11, that's, that's fewer verses, if I'm doing my math right, right, than 1 through 6. And yet, the divine name is mentioned six more times than in the preceding verses. And on top of that, it's not God, Elohim, by which God is named. He's actually named by his personal name. The Lord is how our English translation is translated, but it's the, that four Hebrew letter name called the Tetragrammaton for that reason. Four letters. Yahweh. Now, why would it be that having said so many wonderful things about general revelation, which is the revelation of the glory of God, it's great and wonderful. Why now, six times mention the Lord's name and turn from describing him by this title, God, and describe him by his personal proper name, the Lord, Yahweh. Why do that? Well, the answer is, I think, that the psalmist wants to connect Scripture more closely to God than even creation. 
the creation is the work of God's hands, right? And as such, it says something about its maker. But Scripture is the product of God's own mouth. And therefore, because it is more intimately related to Him, it more deeply and fully reveals Him and His will. Now, we're going to come back to this point about counting the divine names because six is an interesting number. And, and, and there are actually seven times that the Lord's name is mentioned here, but, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, here's what I want you to, to notice about how verses 7 through 11 talk about Scripture. And the variety of ways is really what I want to emphasize here, right? In the psalmist's mind, Scripture is like a diamond. It's multifaceted, and you can't really appreciate it unless you turn it around and see the light reflect, refracting right, from every different angle. So, note uh, six different terms that the psalmist used to describe Scripture in these verses. The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord. This is someone who has a deep and intimate understanding of what Scripture is, and he can describe it in six different ways. Note also, though, that along with these titles, these names for Scripture, the psalmist celebrates also a number of attributes of Scripture. So he says, the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The command of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then, just as in the first section of the psalm, where the psalmist turns to the Son and kind of elaborates on the goodness of general revelation by elaborating on the goodness of the Son, he then elaborates on the goodness of Scripture by these comparisons, comparing it, it's better than gold, even fine gold, it's sweeter than the honeycomb. And, and he talks about the, 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 the way Scripture can warn us of danger and can guide us to reward. These are all ways of, of, of describing the positive benefits of Scripture. Now, very briefly, I think there's a certain logic to the attributes of Scripture that the psalmist is looking at here. So let's, let's talk about them briefly. First, perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does that word mean here? Well, it means that Scripture is complete. It's sound. That is, it has all the parts it needs to be whole. It's entire. This is the word that's used of sacrificial animals, at least the kind that God requires. They have to be without blemish, which means what? It's not missing a leg. It's not missing an eye. It, it's whole. It's complete. It's a term that's also used to describe Noah as someone who walked before the Lord and was blameless. It describes God's call to Abraham in Genesis 17, walk before me and be blameless. That is be complete, have integrity. Well, he says, Scripture is characterized by this wholeness, this fullness. It has everything we need to know God, to trust in Him, to live a life that's pleasing to Him. And I think the, the next two attributes of Scripture are really kind of elaborations on this point. So it's perfect, it's sufficient, all you need, you find it here. It's sure, that is, it's firm, it's trustworthy, it's reliable, okay? It has everything you know, need to know for living a wise life, everything you need to believe about God and salvation and everything else. It's right. The word there also means straight, okay? So, Scripture is sure, it's a firm foundation, you can build your life on it, but it also gives you the straight path to walk on that sure foundation, and so all that you need, this is what in, 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 in theology we call the sufficiency of Scripture. All you need for faith and life, God has revealed it here in His Word. That's what the psalmist is saying. 
The next three descriptions then, pure, clean, true and righteous altogether. I think these are also related, okay? Pure has, purity has the idea of, of Scripture being bright and really of, of it being unmixed brightness. It's not part light, part darkness. It's absolutely pristine. Same thing with clean, right? It, 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 it's not spotted. So you might say it like this. Scripture is truth and nothing but truth. Right? Scripture is morally trustworthy and nothing but morally trustworthy. It's not truth mixed with error. You've got to sort through it. Right? The psalmist does not believe we should approach Scripture like we approach cable news. Like we approach the, the, the stories that flash through our feeds. Okay, where you say, huh, I've got to figure out what's going on here. I've got to separate the truth from the falsehood. I hope we do that, right? Want to weigh the reliability of the source here? Scripture saying, in God's word, you don't have to do that. Because it's truth and nothing but truth. It's right, nothing but right. And this is exactly the, 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 the way... The last description of God's word is given. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And again, it's capturing really the idea of what we believe, truth, what we're called to do, righteous. And it's utterly and absolutely reliable. Utterly, absolutely clear. Now, that's glorious. Scripture is, is a multifaceted reality, and it's characterized by a, a, a multitude of perfections. But the psalmist doesn't stop there in describing Scripture. He not only gives us various terms, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, and so forth. He not only praises Scripture for its various attributes and perfections, but he also wants to make sure we understand Scripture's effects. What Scripture produces. So, back to our descriptions here. The law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And what does it do? It makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. And what does it do? It rejoices the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now, we'll come back to this in a moment, too, when we talk about observations. But, but I want you to notice something that's going on here. Notice how in talking about the effects of Scripture, the psalmist talks about various aspects of human anatomy. Scripture revives the soul, the, the very principle of life within us. It makes wise the simple. Where is the... The faculty of wisdom, the mind, reason. It rejoices the heart, the, the center of the person. It enlightens the eyes. Okay? He even talks about the side of gold, I think. Again, think about the eye. The sweetness of honey, right? The sense of taste is alluded here. What's going on? Why does the psalmist Describe the effects of Scripture by describing the various parts of a human being, various aspects of the human being. Well, the psalmist is using a, a literary device called merism. Any English nerds in here? Probably. What is merism? Well, if... You want me to come fix a problem at your house, I would actually be the wrong person to ask. But let's say you did want me to come fix a problem at your house, and, and you said, it's really complicated, we've got, the, we've got this, you know, AC's broken, but there's a pipe that's also clogged, and da 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 da, -da and you go through those things, and, and, and you weren't sure if I could do it, and I said, don't worry, I've got you covered A to Z. What do I mean? Well, that's merism. 
If I say I've got you covered A to Z, am I saying I, I'm going to be good at the beginning of it and I'm going to be good at the end of it? But someone else needs to help you with all the letters in between. There's 24 other letters. No, what am I saying? I'm speaking of two parts of the alphabet, the beginning and end, and I say I've got the whole thing covered. Right? If you, know, you say uh, someone has got this lock, stock, and barrel. Those are the parts of a gun. What are you saying? You're saying they only have the lock, the stock, and the barrel of the gun? No, you're saying they've got the whole thing, right? Well, when the psalmist appeals to various parts of the human anatomy, he's engaging in this literary device of merism. What's the point? Well, do you remember the first attribute that the psalmist describes in praising Scripture? It's what? Perfect. It's whole. It's complete. This is God's all-sufficient self-revelation. Well, what is he saying about the effect of Scripture? This Scripture, which is characterized by wholeness, has the effect of producing whole persons. It has the effect of making us complete. Psalm 1 says the same thing in a slightly different way. Remember how it starts by praising the happiness, the well-being of the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly and so forth, but who meditates on the law day and night. And then what does he say? He will be like a tree. Well, what kind of tree? An old, dead, leafless, shriveling tree? No, like a tree planted by rivers of living water, which what? Bears its fruit in its season, and in whatever it does, it prospers. The psalmist says, that's what somebody who has meditated on the Lord looks like. They're a complete, whole, flourishing human being. Now, this is a wonderful thing to say about Scripture. The psalmist says, God has revealed himself in creation. He's revealed his faithfulness. He's revealed his universal sovereignty. He's, he's revealed his goodness. He's revealed himself more fully in Scripture, giving us a perfect word that's sure, that's right, that's unmixed with error, that's unmixed with anything bad, and whose end is to make whole and complete human beings. In verse 12, we have a kind of jarring interruption to the, the mood of the psalm. The, psalm. the psalmist has been praising the Lord as he reveals himself through creation, declaration after declaration. The psalmist has been pra praising the Lord as he reveals himself in Scripture, declaration after declaration of the perfections of Scripture. Now we turn from these Glorious declarations of praise to a question. Who can discern his errors? And, 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 and here's what's going on here. The psalmist says that God's self-revelation in creation, that God's self-revelation in Scripture, has led the psalmist himself to an alarming self-understanding. The heavens praise God in all that they do. Scripture is whole and complete. And yet the psalmist recognizes that he is out of harmony with creation. His words do not honor God the way creation's words do. He recognizes that he is out of step with Scripture. Scripture is whole, but he's not whole. And in fact, it, 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 it's, it's worse than that, because what he says is, I don't even understand the fullness of my fault. God's revelation in Scripture, which announces the divine king and his coming, right? it has had the effect on a sinner 
of causing him to be afraid. God's revelation in Scripture, which reveals God's will, has had the effect on a sinner of, of helping him realize that he's transgressed God's word, and indeed that there are ways that he doesn't even realize he's transgressed God's word. This is quite the interruption to the psalm. Well, note what the psalmist does. He realizes that he can't bring himself into harmony with the world. He realizes that he cannot make himself whole. And so what does he do? He prays. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's fascinating, and we're going to observe this in just a moment, that the psalmist appeals to two words that he's already mentioned earlier in the psalm. One is the word words. Okay? The other is a verbal form of an adjective he used earlier, blameless. Viewing the words of creation that glorify God, viewing the blamelessness, the perfection of Scripture, which reveals God's perfect will, and realizing that he and his life are out of step with that, he knows that he has no power in himself to fix himself. And so what does he do? He asks the Lord to forgive him, to acquit him of his sins. But he asks him to so renew him that his life would be blameless, that it would be complete, that it would reflect what God's word can make it to be, but only by God's grace enabling him to do it. He asks that the words of his mouth might be acceptable and the language there of acceptable is, 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 is the language of, of sacrifice that would be pleasing to God as the words of creation are pleasing to God. And how does the psalmist's prayer conclude? O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The, the foundation of his confidence in prayer is that the Lord is his rock and that the Lord is his redeemer. Now, one more thing to note here, and this will help us transition to our, our second point. You remember earlier I said the divine name Elohim, used one time in verses 1 through 6, God. The divine personal proper name, Yahweh, the Lord, is used six times in verses 7 through 11. Well, we don't want to get too carried away with, with this little fact in interpreting the Bible, but numbers do matter in Scripture. In verse 14, we have a seventh time where the Lord's name is mentioned. Why is that? Well, here's what I want to suggest to you. Seven is a number of completion. Seven is a number of perfection. Right? God rested on the seventh day. If that is what's going on in this text, then what does it say about the nature of God's self-revelation in Scripture? Here's what it is, I think. Is that not only does Scripture reveal God and God's will to us, but Scripture also, and, and verses 12 through 14 are an instance of this. Scripture teaches us how to speak to God. And indeed, the course of revelation is not brought to its conclusion until the creature that is addressed by God in covenant addresses his or her covenant God. And this, I think, is the final kind of crowning glory of Scripture. That God in the Scripture not only reveals His perfect will, but He reveals the way that we may approach Him. How? By calling on His name, asking for mercy and forgiveness, asking Him to renew us, that our lives might conform to His Word, that they might reflect the wholeness 
of his word. And the reason we can do this is because he is our rock and our redeemer, our covenant God. So that's a lot of great reasons to give attention to scripture. I want to turn now and in the last part of our time in this first lesson, asking the interpretive, so what? If this is what scripture is, right? If this is why scripture is worthy of our attention, it's sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. It's, it's more valuable than fine gold. How do we give it the attention it deserves? How, how do we learn to savor that honeycomb, to draw out its sweetness? And there's a sense in which all the future lessons in this course are going to be answering this how question. But I want to start with what I think is kind of the foundational moment of that how question. How do we give our attention? And the answer is, we listen. We look. We try to see everything that's there. Now, I'm going to say something you really don't like. I promise you, you're not going to like this, but it's true. I'm about to give you some kind of basic guidance about how to pay attention to Scripture, how to cultivate attention to Scripture, but here's the trick. Anytime I come to a text, I don't know what to look for before I'm looking at it. And that's almost the, the first and most fundamental thing about listening to Scripture. Right? Remember we were earlier talking about someone who talks over you in conversation? Right? A good way to talk over the text in conversation is to come to it thinking, oh, I know what I need to find here. I know what I'm looking for here. And again, as we grow as interpreters, we do have a better sense of the kinds of things we can expect to find from Scripture. But there's a sense in which real listening to Scripture is not knowing what you're going to see till you actually look, till you have to pay attention. And what that means is, I don't know when I start looking at a text and I start making observations, whether they're good observations or bad observations. That's, that's another way we get ourselves in trouble. We, we try to start weighing whether this is valuable or not. You know, imagine if an archaeologist goes to a, a dig and, and starts digging things up and and, and just pulling things out of the ground and say, oh, this is probably worthless, Phew, throw whatever is said, oh, this might be good, throw, you know, keep this or whatever. That's not how you do it, is it? You, you collect, you label everything, and then you go back and say, okay, what is this? Is this important, not important? That's how we have to approach Scripture as well. Truly listening to Scripture is, is, is not coming with the preset agenda of what we expect to find on one level. I don't know. Again, there is a truth in which we do know, but, but I'm overemphasizing the point. Well, what then are some rules of thumb for cultivating attention? I'm going to give you some. They're very simple. Um, they are somewhat labor-intensive, but, but they are helpful for cultivating attention to Scripture. Four points here. First, count words. Count words. What do you mean count words? I mean count words. Count how many times you see the same word in a passage. So let me give you a couple of examples here. I mentioned already God, Elohim. How many times did it appear? One time. Lord. How many times did it appear? Seven times. The, lang the, the word words. Okay, there's actually at least three different Hebrew words for words, but the one that's translated words of my mouth in verse 14, it's actually translated with two different English words, which is going to throw you off, which is why it's good to learn the original languages if you really want to know what's going on. But the word for speech in verse 2 and 3 is the same word for words in verse 14. So what does that mean? The word for words is used three times. Now, uh, blameless, I mentioned this. You get an adjectival form. The, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect or blameless. And then uh, the prayer that I shall be blameless, verse 13. Again, so two times. Now, why are we counting words? Well, my Bible does have a 
heading at the top of verse 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. Your Bible probably does too. But guess what? That heading was added by the translator, right? What my Bible doesn't have is kind of subheadings. Here's the first section of Psalm 19. Here's the second section of of Psalm 19. The Bible doesn't come that way. Wouldn't it be nice if it did? Well, how then do we know what the main theme of a text is? How do we know how to divide a text into its different parts so we can catch the flow of its argument? Well, one of the ways of doing that is by paying attention to words and counting words. So that's going to tell us what the author is emphasizing and how he's emphasizing it. Now, counting words doesn't mean just counting the same words that are used, but it can also be counting synonyms or, or varied descriptions. And in Psalm 19 is a good example of this, right? Because it's not just the word word that it uses three times, but it also uses other words for speech, right? Pours forth speech, declares, use the language of knowledge. But think about the law. You've got at least six different descriptions of the law. And so that says something about what the focus of the psalm is. Can't stop talking about it. Come back to that in a moment. Define key words. That's another important thing to do. Uh, There may be words in Scripture that we don't understand. I spent some time this afternoon again looking up the Hebrew words for perfect and so forth. Because I want to remind myself... What exactly is, is the, the, not only the kind of dictionary meaning here, but what's the context? Okay. Dictionary meaning is, is, here's the basic kind of range of meanings this term can, can have. But then a connotation is kind of like, how do other passages in Scripture use this term? And that's a way of, of, of getting familiarity with, with what's going on in a text. Uh, a third way of cultivating attention. Discern the imagery. You know anybody who, who, who is not good with metaphors? Right? A lot of us have kids. And, and, and one of the kind of developmental stages in a kid's life, right, is going from the place where they take everything literally till they start realizing when, oh no, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically here, right? Well, a really important part of understanding Scripture is understanding not only when Scripture is speaking in a non-literal way, but trying to get a sense of what it's saying in its figure of speech. So, this psalm has a lot of imagery, and, and frankly, Hebrew poetry is chock full of imagery, but we'll see in other kinds of texts in later weeks, narrative has imagery, Apocalyptic literature, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature, it's full of imagery. Well, we want to identify those images, we want to understand what's going on. So, we talked about the the image of the heavens themselves declaring the glory of the Lord, and I suggest to you that, that based on kind of comparison with other texts, based on understanding better kind of ancient Near Eastern backgrounds, that it seems to me that you've got the heavens being pictured as royal ambassadors, the divine king. And that's pretty important for understanding what the psalmist is saying. Think about the the comparisons that are made regarding the sun, the bridegroom coming out of his chamber, strong man running its course with joy. We don't understand that unless we we, we have a sense of what's the picture the psalmist is trying to paint. The, the, The literary device of merism, lock, stock, and barrel, the psalmist likes that. Comparisons with gold and honey, right? I mean, in some ways, I feel myself perhaps uh, falling short in understanding the psalm because the only honeycombs I've really known before are the cereal. So I've just described something. I've I've actually never put a honeycomb in my mouth. Okay. So understanding the image is important to understand the point that's being communicated. The Lord is our rock. What does that say about the Lord? Now, here's why this is so important. It's not only important for understanding the text, but... You know, the last lesson in this course is, is, you know, this is from exegesis to exposition. We're talking about how to communicate what you've understood, right? How to turn from the archaeologist who's dug up various artifacts to the museum curator who's presenting them for others to see and enjoy, 
Well, when we understand the imagery of a passage, you know what that does for us? It puts us in a position for helping people perceive the vividness of Scripture. Right? Uh, good preachers use good illustrations. Right? It, it, it's a gift of communication. Um, but the more familiar we are with biblical imagery, the more we realize that God has actually given a lot of the images and illustrations that we need to help people understand His Word better. And so, paying attention to imagery. Here's the thing about it. This is actually something that is really hard for people who are very familiar with Scripture. Why? Because we've forgotten that they're metaphors. Think about something as basic as, as saying, God is my salvation. Think, oh, I know what salvation is. But you know salvation's a metaphor? What? Yeah. Deliverance? What are we talking about? We're talking about a battle. And we're talking about a king who has rescued someone from their enemy. Okay? Well, we're so used to talking about salvation that we... Biblical imagery, it, it, be, it becomes bleached. And so we have to look at Scripture with new eyes and make sure we don't miss it. And I'm telling you, those of us who are most familiar with the text, this can be the hardest thing because we just... It talks about these words, atonement, justification, and we forget... They're painting a picture, and, we, and, we, and we, we don't even fully understand it because we're not thinking about that picture. The, the fourth step, not the fourth step, the fourth tool for cultivating attention, and, and, and this is something that really it takes all of the things you're going to be hearing about in various lessons to do well, is to try to determine the relationships between words. Relationships both on the small scale, relationships on the large scale. Let me give you just one example of large scale relationships of words. Now, I, I didn't count how many words are in Psalm 19. But remember the observation I made earlier that in verses 1 through 6, you've got the divine name God one time. Verses 7 through 11, you've got the divine name Lord six times and so forth. And then verses 12 through 14, one time again. That already says something that we might have two sections of this psalm. Why? Because the clustering of words can be an indication of, of, of thematic structure. And of course, you start paying attention for two seconds, you realize, well, yeah, I mean, verses 1 through 6 are talking about how God reveals himself through the world. And verses 7 through 11, 12 and 14, really, how God reveals himself through his word. Now, here's the thing. Even understanding that basic division of Psalm 19 already gets you pretty far down the world, the, the road, not only understanding what is its main point, which I'll say something about in a second, but also understanding how it develops its main point. Okay, the flow of the text. And so in studying scripture, this is what we're after. And these basic kind of habits of cultivating attention to Scripture are very helpful for doing that. Now, in future weeks, Dr. Furtado in the next lesson is going to talk about literary genre. That's a very important tool for understanding how different parts of a text relate to each other, how the different words relate to each other. Do you know that a narrative text have, has one kind of flow? A poetic text has a different kind of flow. And if you realize this is narrative, not poetry, you can be more alert to the way the text is flowing, right? Uh, when you hear from Dr. Reed and Dr. Cole in the third and fourth lessons, they're going to talk about how Scripture is an unfolding history of redemption, right? This is also important for figuring out how does my text relate to the whole counsel of God. Now, as we come to a conclusion, I want to mention kind of four things that you're after in paying attention to the text. Okay? What are the ends of attention? What does it mean to taste the sweetness? Four things. First, what we're trying to understand is the subject matter of the text. What is this text about? And let me ask you, if you were to say, 
one word. <laughs> what is the main subject matter of Psalm 19? What would it be? Revelation? Communication? Speech? Something like that. Right? How God speaks to us. How God communicates to us. Second thing, you want to understand the flow of the text. And in a sense, these, these first two ends of, 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 of attention and observation are really the most important products of biblical interpretation. You want to know what it's about? That's the subject matter. You want to know how it's about what it's about. That's the flow of the text. How does my passage unpack its topic? Well, how does Psalm 19 unpack its topic of divine revelation? Well, it moves from a lesser form of divine revelation to a greater form, right? There's a crescendo. Yes, general revelation is wonderful, but how much greater, how much better, how much sweeter is special revelation, okay? And, and the flow of the text can be how do the different verses and sentences relate to each other, but more importantly, how do the bigger paragraphs and larger units of discourse relate to each other? A third observation, then, is what is the point of the text? What is the text trying to accomplish? In the fifth lecture for this course, Dr. Allen's going to talk about application. That's what this third question is about. What does this text want me to believe? What does this text want me to hope? How does this text want me to love God, love God? neighbor? What does it want me to avoid? These are all questions. How does it want to comfort me? We want to, to hear this text answer to the passage because when we teach a passage, that's the, what we want to be the point of our teaching as well. We want it to flow out of the text. We don't want to treat the text like a wax nose that we make say what we want it to say. We want to follow the point of the text. The last thing that we're looking for in any passage of Scripture is the one who is the central subject matter of all of Scripture. Christ, the handsome king that psalmist in Psalm 45 describes. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Christ is the true honey that is hidden in the honeycomb. Now, one of the ways we can stub our toe in biblical interpretation is trying to find Jesus too quickly. You know the old joke about uh, pastors doing the children's sermon and, and, he, and he brings in a picture of a squirrel and says, look how furry, and blah, blah, blah. what is that, kids? And they say, Jesus, right? Because that's always the right answer. <laughs> and we can do that interpretation too, but one of the things we'll work on in this course, and again, Doctors Reed and Doctors Cole, when they talk about redemptive historical interpretation, that's one of the major focuses of redemptive historical interpretation. How does this passage portray Christ? Because the truth is, is that the heavens that declare the glory of God ultimately proclaim the glory of the one who is the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact imprint of his being, right? The scriptures that celebrate the law of the Lord and its perfection, they ultimately celebrate the man who did not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the path of sinners, but delighted himself in the law of the Lord. When scriptures talk about the warnings of disobeying God's word, they talk about the Christ who bore the curses of the covenant for his people. And when Scripture talks about the reward that comes in keeping Scripture, they talk about the one who won that reward for us. Scripture presents to us Christ, the handsome King, the truth of all Scripture. He is the one who is more valuable than gold, than fine gold. And He is the one, when we savor Scripture, who is sweeter than the honey of the honeycomb. And we may fact expect to find him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the privilege of having it, for the privilege of studying it, and we ask that you would equip us to be both better readers and interpreters of your word and better communicators of it as well throughout this course. And we ask it that we might both know and proclaim Jesus Christ, the most handsome of the sons of men, in whose name we pray. Amen.